Thank you for joining us here today at the 2023 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Leo Fondrius, and I'm a first year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. And it is my pleasure to introduce our panel today. We have the play-by-play -play of the future, navigating the evolving landscape of sports media. Our panelists today are Russell Wolf, Executive VP and GM, ESPN. Michael Markovich, Chief Commercial Officer, Sony Sports Business. And Tim Clark, Senior VP and Chief Digital Officer, NASCAR. Our panel will be moderated by Allison Overholt of the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. And our panel will run for about 45 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. You can submit your questions via Twitter using the hashtag sportsmedia. I will be moderating those, sending those over to Allison, and she will filter through and select the best questions to ask. Uh, so yeah, please submit those, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Allison. Fantastic, thanks Leo. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, our panel abstract describes this moment as arguably the most exciting yet uncertain time in sports media history. Now, in our conversation among the four of us earlier this week to prep for today, I heard a lot of other words to describe this moment that we're in. Complex, innovative, utterly unpredictable, and absolutely exciting. So we've got big tech winning sports media rights contracts. We're already in a post-bundle world in terms of consumer consumption of all content, and now also for live sports content. And social media continues to be the go-to platform for younger generations. So today we've got the great fortune of sitting here, hearing from executives representing the major players in the space. Russell from ESPN Plus, we've got Michael from Sony's sports executive team, and we've got Tim from NASCAR. We made a promise to each other before the panel, no buzzword bingo up here today. I believe, Russell, you may have said it, no metaverse, no Web3, blah, blah, blah. But we do promise a wide-ranging, robust conversation about the current and future state of sports media, particularly the technology innovations around fan engagement and the consumption of live sports across platforms. All right, Russell, let's start with you. As the rights holder on the panel, we know this isn't a binary either-or dilemma. We need all of these platforms. But tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about the relationship between streaming and cable and how sports business models are evolving as a result. So it's interesting. I mean, if we did this panel 20 years ago, we would have said we were on the cusp and in the middle of transformative change at that moment. And I think we've been saying that same thing for the whole 26 years that I've been at ESPN, because when you look at what's been happening over these quarter of a century I've been there, like we literally have been, it's, you know, gambling's coming, streaming's coming, you know, AI's coming, VR's coming, and it's all been coming and in stages and been changing dramatically over those years. And I think at the moment, like we don't think of ourselves as a broadcaster. We think of ourselves as a multi-platform sports media entertainment company. And so, you know, as, as a company that's been streaming for a long time in a different business model than we're streaming today, you know, the first iteration of it was, you know, ESPN Broadband, ESPN 365, all of those things were, were we were streaming at times an unauthenticated version of some ESPN content, then an authenticated version of ESPN content, all the way down to today where you land at ESPN Plus and you're streaming content that's complementary to ESPN, the linear networks, for a fee paid directly to us, which was that direct-to-consumer future that we've been coming to for years. You know, for us, in 2015, we sold the Cricket World Cup. You know, Shane's a cricket fan. Um, the Cricket World Cup direct to consumers for 100 bucks in, in 2015. And after that, the next big thing we do, we launch ESPN Plus. And so I think the change that's happening has been, has been happening for a long time. And the streaming capability has been there for a long time. So none of the streaming part is innovative. Not Thursday night, not Sunday night, not TVE. That's been happening for a long time. What's, what really feels like it's different today, I think, is that the business models are starting to shift. We're now selling some of that directly to consumers. And some people have been doing that for a long time. By the way, think pay-per-view. And I'm all, I only think pay-per-view because I'm getting ready for UFC 285 tomorrow. <laughs> but like, pay-per-view has been going on for a long time. That's a direct-to-consumer business model that's existed for 30 years, probably. And so a lot of these things are the confluence of the technology and the business models coming together in different ways than they have before. 
So Michael, when we were talking about this earlier, you spoke about how the role of each of these platforms is distinct. You know, the, what works on, on each is actually different. Can you tell us some more about that? Yeah, I mean, it, I think Russell summed it up well, and, and I would say there's so much energy prior that do you go with traditional media, do you go with streaming, how do you pit one against each other and pick a platform? And I think the energy, and it's shifted, I think the energy now is what does my content play for each one of those platforms, and what can I do to leverage one or the other? And, and Russell, you mentioned it, there should be different content for each one of those, those platforms you choose. Traditional media still is aggregating the largest audiences that, that you're gonna see off of, of, of any platform. So it's alive and well. Uh, but it, it really, in my mind, is for traditional fans and for core fans. I personally like sitting in front of a television and enjoying media as I have for the last several years. But if you're on a streaming platform, just putting the stream out there, uh, a digital platform, um, it, it should be different. You should be taking advantage of all the different technology you can put against it. And then you go on to a social play or an Insta or a Facebook or a YouTube. Um, it, it's just different consumption habits. It's short form content that's gonna really play, someone's not gonna sit through a three and a half, four and a half, four hour match. Um, so I really think, and credit to, to Russell and, and Tim and others, there's been an adaptation of let me find out how to find my, my home on content across all these different platforms and I can serve the five or six or seven different audiences in different ways because now I have the flexibility with technology to produce different cuts of, of the same kind of content. Yeah. Now, have any of the three of you noticed in, in the very recent past, has that mix been shifting? Have those roles been shifting? Because there's always been the mix, and it's, you know, the, the change, as Russell mentioned, it feels like it's been looming, and then now we're seeing, we're, we're kind of here. So, like, have you seen that mix shifting in a significant way in the, in the last year or two? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for, for us, um, you know, and Mike makes a really good point, it, it, it for the longest time was the biggest and best screen available and, and that quickly shifted and, and that's not just because of the, the device or the technology, it's just the, the, the platform convenience. It's, it's now um, what you wanna watch on your terms, uh, that's, that's what I think rights holders and, and media companies are, are being asked to deliver. Um, and I think the you know, if you think about this in, in the full circle way of how all of this content was bundled under, uh, under every umbrella, and now you, you in many ways think that the pay-per-view model seems so, uh, seems so aged, but you know, uh, a, a Jake Paul pay-per-view match is, is going to be <coughs> talked about not only on those platforms, but it's going to be the biggest social buzz that will, will happen at any given time. So I, I think you know, the, the, while it doesn't feel like antiquated thinking, it's, it, this space moves so quickly that that you know whatever is feels ubiquitous today feels antiquated tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I mean, Jake Paul's a good example, right? I mean, last weekend, 2 p.m. on a Sunday. If you would have told the world that 2 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, you were going to have, you know, a, a internet star boxing the brother of the heavyweight champion, and a lot of people were going to sign up and watch, and and they did on our platform and the other, you know. MVPD platforms, somebody would have told you you were crazy on a Sunday afternoon at two o'clock. And yet it happened. And I think there's just a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, momentum for people who want what they want to go get it. And, and, and when willingness and capacity to, to pay for it, whether that's a pay-per-view or to have NFL Sunday ticket in its old iteration with with DirecTV and what will be its new and I think exciting iteration, you know, uh, with YouTube. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, everybody sort of forgets that the, that all rights holders, right, all rights holders actually participate in all of the ecosystems and their livelihood is based on the success of the total of all of the ecosystems. So I don't think any league or conference is sitting there going, we really want streaming to be successful and and, and ABC, CBS, and Fox to not be. They want them all to get more people to watch more of it so that the people who buy their rights from them can pay them more. And this is, we talked about this, the other, we, we had a fun chat the other day. You know, some of this is about, this isn't this against that, not from a rights holder perspective, you know, not from an ESPN perspective. We're not, we're not trying to get people to do different. We're trying to get people to do more. And I think as you think about that, you know, the leagues are more committed to and reliant on the success of all of these things, mm -hmm. unless and until something can fully replace the other thing because they want more money, not the same money, not less money. And so 
trading, you know, they used to say in the old days, you know, trading digital do dollars, <laughs> linear dollars to digital dimes isn't good business. And it, it's not good, it wasn't good business 25 years ago, and it's not good business today. Yeah, so keep talking a little bit more about that as we look at this ecosystem and it's, it's intertwining and growing. It gets more complex, the consumption habits shift. How is that impacting the way that you as a rights holder think about rights contracts? You know, we only get to think about rights contracts the way they let us think about rights contracts, right? And Mike used to be at the That's NFL. That's my next question. Mike used to be at the NFL. Mike used to be at the NFL. So we can only buy things the way the seller will sell them. We can influence them and try to get them to sell them the way we want them to sell them to us. But ultimately, you know, we are uh, we are we are buyers, and I think we're in the business of valuing these rights, whatever they are, whether they're, you know, NFL rights or. NASCAR rights or UFC rights or, or even a standalone single pay-per-view event for anything, our job is to try to figure out how much we can pay for it and, and make good money for ourselves. And I think it's become more complex just because there's more platforms in play, right? And so, and by the way, it used to be that everyone who was buying the stuff was sort of playing the same game. If we went back a while ago, nobody was trying to figure out how much it is worth to them who have a service where you get free delivery. Like CBS and Fox and NBC who we were competing with weren't offering free delivery for groceries, right? And yet now we're competing with people who have that economics baked into what they do. You know, and think about it, when DirecTV bought Sunday Ticket, they were baking in the economics of getting more people to sign up for DirecTV. YouTube TV is baked in whatever economics they've baked into valuing that. And so I think we've got pretty good at valuing our multitude of platforms, the highlights we get, the live rights, the replay rights, the archives. But when we started ESPN Plus, you know, we knew how to value things for linear, but you have to get into it. You don't even really know what the retention rates are gonna be for, for a streaming service that you haven't launched yet until you do it. And so your valuations get honed over time as you get into that new business model. They're all assumptions at the beginning. I think it's been a fun, interesting ride for us honing those those models based on the data and the analytics in terms of how to value the rights that, that Tim and, and Mike's former colleagues are selling. Yeah. Well, so Tim, oh, sorry. Yeah, the one thing I was going to add is that um, not to defend my former life and to defend Tim for driving up rights fees <laughs> on you, Russell, but I, I think one thing is it makes you really think about there, there's such a, a competitive tension and there's so much that you're putting into uh, value against these rights. I have to do everything I can with them not just put them on the traditional streams. I, I think it actually challenges you to say, how can I cut them up into clips that's gonna appeal to younger fans and put them on different platforms like we were talking about at the beginning. Um, you know, a lot of the things that, that we're collaborating on now um, is I need something fundamentally different to appeal to a younger audience on all the different platforms I have to play with. And if I don't do it, then the rights are gonna come back to the league and they're gonna do it themselves. So I want that within my ecosystem. So. Um, certainly not defending all the inflation that happened over the years, but at the same time, no. I, did, I, does, I think it does force some creativity of we need to do anything and everything to get this content out in every different walks of life and phases um, to make it worth the investment, which is very, very substantial these days. That's right. I mean, Tim, can, yeah, Tim, Tim, I'm curious can, for your thoughts from where you're sitting. How is your thinking around rights contracts change as consumption patterns shift? Uh, I'm just glad that Mike defended the inflation so I didn't have. <laughs> um, I, I think he's spot on. Um, Look, I, I think it's it's really interesting if you really get into the the science of of media rights and 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 media as a whole. Um, you know, I think for us, the the development of of our schedule every year is one of the most fascinating things that that I think you could you know if you if everyone could see behind the curtain on that, I think the perceptions of it would 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 really start to change. I mean, you think about the dynamics of. You know, if, if you're going to take NASCAR fans and, and put them on a, on a media platform, whatever that is, whether it's, it's NBC, Fox, ESPN, Amazon, what have you, you're now taking dynamics that are unique to NASCAR fans and then plugging them into a media platform where they have their own unique characteristics. And then if you lay that on top of the schedule, now you're talking about, well, from a broadcast window, a two o'clock Sunday afternoon start would be ideal. But for selling tickets to 160,000 people that are going to be on property, for a three-day period of time, that may not be the ideal period to get them in and out and, and enjoy the you know the the price of the ticket. So, it there's there's so many factors that, that come into play of this, and I and I think that's probably why all of us have been doing what we have been doing for so long, 
because it is, it, it's equal parts art and science. I mean, the art of the content and the product that you're delivering is fascinating, but it, it really pales into comparison to the science of figuring out how you're gonna package this and deliver it on the right platform to, to reach the biggest audience. All right, right. so let's other, stay with you. Also, rights holders, like people, they, it's, think about any other business in the world where the person who sells you something also tries to take that same thing and take it directly to the consumer and make money themselves, right? Your grocer doesn't like, the milk store doesn't sell the milk to the grocery store and then come, maybe they do, come knocking on your door to say, don't buy it from them, buy it from us. And like, the, this ecosystem is, is, is wildly complex that way because you can go to nfl.com and you can go to nascar.com and you can go to nhl.com and get great content and some, sometimes deeper than you can get in other places, um, not deeper than you get from us, but you know, deeper, I mean, got like 108 million people who come to us each month to, to watch this stuff and do this stuff with us. But, you know, the leagues are also invested in being media companies and have been for a long time. And so they're finding the balance between optimizing the value to their partners, clients, and to themselves without overstepping and, and ruining that balance between being a supplier and being a, a home base for their own brand. I mean, you guys... Have, or as big as anybody in that space, Tim, and from NASCAR right. digital perspective. So we've been talking mostly, we've, we've talked about this ecosystem, but we've been focused mostly on um, the relationship between linear and streaming live sports. But social media, obviously, in the mix as well, particularly for the youngest cohort of fans. So, Tim, I'd like to start with you for a second. How is NASCAR thinking about different strategies and even different content? for each of the platforms, but particularly around social media? Yeah, I, I, the question is so interesting because it, it, it used to be that, you know, we talked about linear platforms and digital platforms and then social platforms. And, and social was just kind of this, you create content and, you know, here's the Facebook version, here's the Twitter version, here's the Instagram version, and it, it's not that anymore. It's, there's a very distinct content development strategy and a programming and community strategy for each of those platforms. And they are very different, and and you know you will you will learn very quickly that um, you know the 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 one size fits all approach is is not going to grow your fan base, and and certainly not going to grow your product. Um, you know I, I think there's there's some degree of of leaning into who that audience is. So, look for a sport like ours, there's we've got a you know we're in our 75th year. There's 74 years worth of history that we can draw through for content on these various platforms, but. You know, does the, the throwback content appeal to uh, a 19-year-old on TikTok? Probably not, and, and, and based on our analytics, I would say almost certainly not. Um, but that's okay, I, I think, as, as long as you can adapt to those channels and to those platforms and the audiences and, and how they're, they're consuming content, again, on, on, their, on their terms. Um, one of the conversations we have about content or the terms we use more often than not is is unselfish you know we we can't we can't uh depend on fans to consume content in a way and on a platform that's convenient for us um so i think the the more we can lean into what's going to be the on the fan or the consumer terms whether it be platform whether it be length whether it be style whatever the case may be um i, I think it moves the needle significantly more than than the, the more selfish content got it I'd love to talk a little more about the changing habits and behaviors of, of that younger generation. Um, I've been teaching a course at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism on the business of media and journalism. And as it happens this morning, I was hearing our final presentations from our students. So I heard 10 pitches um, from, from the different teams in the class on new media offerings or products or tools or apps that they would want to pitch today. The class is not sports specific, it's any media. But what was interesting to me is that all of the ideas were completely different. Some were arts, some were local news, some were budgeting tools, some were data viz. Um, but the through line through all of it is that none of them felt like their generation was being effectively served by the way media is being delivered right now. Um, and all 10 of the projects were fundamentally social in their orientation. Um, and that just really put me in a certain mindset for this conversation today. I'd love to hear from all of you. How are you thinking and what are you doing to engage young fans differently? 
Well, I guess I'll start and just say I'm fascinated by what social media has been able to accomplish. And I, I actually don't believe uh, a lot of the content that we spend a lot of our time on to generate, um, which is collecting data from the field and the stadiums and arenas and transforming that into something new, unique, different um, that can live alongside of a broadcast because we think we can create some complementary content. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily we, we're rushing to put it on social media platforms. I would say we just want that same kind of behavior where I see we're marketing like crazy and back in my prior life, just marketing, please watch this, come to this platform, watch our content, where uh, social media, what I see is, I don't know what I want, I'm just gonna go there. I'm gonna flip around a lot and there's gonna be something I find there that's incredibly engaging and I'm gonna stay there for 10, 15, 25, 30 minutes where, again, you're begging to hold on to some of these fans and some of this consumption and you have no chance with young fans who, you know, they'll, they'll just change their mind and there'll be, you know, something that distracts them and they go on to something else. So uh, I really envy, you want to have your content be as sticky as uh, behaviors well in Twitter. Um, some of the things we're doing, I mean, I think there's got to be a play on, we're not going to try and jam a sport or a piece of content down your throat. We're going to find a tie that you care about and then really kind of pull that thread. And so, you know, Russell, just talk a bit about the things that we're trying to do together from a beyond sports standpoint, uh, NHL and, and ESPN, and credit to just thinking differently and thinking big of, we can't get, just use the example we're gonna do, we're gonna take an NHL hockey game, the Rangers versus the uh, Capitals, and a, a seven-year-old's not gonna say, Dad, I really wanna sit in front of the TV and watch the Rangers versus the Capitals on, you know, on, on, on this day during the week, but- We hope not, they will. <laughs> well, they watch this, this <laughs> conversation, but, um, T take a, a show like Big City Greens, which is clearly for kids, it's animated, and um, turn something that's two-dimensional on the TV into a three-dimensional broadcast of this hockey game. You, you may have no affinity to hockey whatsoever as a seven, eight, 10, 15-year-old. You may have no idea who even plays on both teams within Rangers Capitals, but now I'm taking fans and um, characters and, and avatars that I really do care about, and uh, I'm actually superimposing it into uh, an NHL game and I watch. And how long they watch, I don't know. I hope they watch for three hours uh, for your sake, Russell. But uh, at the same time, I think that's the kind of thing is go to what they want to do and really transform sport rather than trying to jam traditional sport down their throats on the traditional channels that myself, I grew up on. But that's just not the behavior and taste of the, of the new audiences. Yep. And, and it's interesting. I mean, this is one where we'll take a game and we'll, we'll deliver the traditional broadcast on ABC and ESPN Plus. We'll, 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 we'll take the big city greens format that, that Beyond Sport is working with us to, 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 to develop and put that out on Disney Plus and Disney Channel and ESPN Plus. And when you get to ESPN Plus, you'll have your choice between the two. And you know, we, we think, you know, when we think about any of these decisions, you know, we, we always fall back to our mission statement, which is to serve sports fans anytime, anywhere, and it's served us well for a long time. And, you know, part of that service is choice. Part of that service is is convenience. You know, the whole conversation earlier Tim raised about you know the best available screen. You know, seven, ten years ago, you would said the best available screen, which would have naturally been defined as the biggest screen. And I think my sons, 19 and 21 years old, would say best available screen is the one I most want to use in the moment, not necessarily the big screen, because you know the he's just as happy watching something on his iPad on his bed as he. As, as I am watching it on the big screen in the, in the den. And so I think it's a combination of choice and both of content and, and device. And I think philosophically, we've for a long time believed we want to you know, serve fans anytime, anywhere. And for us, that meant making your ESPN subscription that you got from DirecTV or Comcast or YouTube TV available inside our app. So you take your, you take your credentials, you put it inside the app, and you can watch ESPN anywhere you want. Right? Some people call that authentication, TV everywhere, but that ability to do that is a big part of giving fans the choice of where they want to watch it and on which device they want to watch it. And we think, and by the way, I, I don't think we're you know, unique in that. I think we've all in the media business come to realize when you're stuck on the train, you want to watch Hulu and check out Below Deck if you're me. You know, when you're, when you're okay, Real Housewives of Salt Lake, fine. Um, but, but, but when you're when the game's on live and, and you're stuck in the airport and it's not the local game, so it's not on the TV in the airport, you want to go sit in the in the corner of plugged into a plug and watch the Rangers or the New York Giants and Boston Celtics for those of you up here, right? And so I think I think the ability to do that is is important across the ecosystem, you know. And while it was once a competitive advantage for us because we did it first, I think the fact that everybody now does that makes it 
It makes it better for fans. So let's shift to talking a little bit about esports and gaming. So there was a, a time when we talked about that also in this sort of almost falsely zero sum way, um, esports versus stick and ball sports. But like our platform discussion, it feels like we've moved into a place where this is not a binary relationship anymore. Michael, I'd love to hear a little bit from you about what you're learning from the gaming world about how to innovate fan engagement. Yeah, um, I think in a nutshell, you know, there's real life and, and there's the real product and traditional product, and, and that's one subset of fans. But I think, again, if you look at, think about the youth, youth, younger audiences and youth, it's engaging, giving them control to kind of create their own destinies and create their alternate universes or whatever it might be. And, and so, you know, thinking about PlayStation, thinking about some of the things we're trying to do with data that we capture and recreating the actual match or game, it, it's just merging the two where you can almost toggle between live and see the authentic stream and the authentic match and then I can take control and do whatever I want with that and gamify that experience and make it my own. I don't think there's, I mean, I'm certainly guilty of it. I don't think there's anyone that said, oh, why are you making that you know, decision and subbing out that player and putting that player in? I could do better than the coach can do or I could have fielded that ball better than, than that, that player could. And, and so I think giving the control in this gamified world is really something, uh, a path that we potentially can go down uh, hopefully sometime soon. And that, that I think is very, very, very exciting is um, simulations, controlling your own destiny. The amount of technology we have today, you know, we can do these different sliding doors and what if paths uh, within sports in a live and real time fashion. And, and again, I think that's the kind of experiential you have to bring to the table to get people that are not innately just obsessed with a sport and obsessed with a team and obsessed with following in a traditional manner. Uh, which I, I think is really exciting, and I think it, again, gives control to the, the individuals that are consuming. So you mentioned the ability even to take a game that's been played very recently and replay it again and pursue those different paths. Um, Russell, you mentioned something similar that you saw at the NBA Tech Summit, right? Yeah, so we were in, we were in Salt Lake at the NBA Tech Summit a couple weeks ago, I think President's Day weekend, and Adam Silver got up and, and presented this technology where um, he he scanned Ahmad Rashad's body. You should go online and look at it, it's pretty cool. He scanned Ahmad Rashad, Ahmad Rashad was there, he went up to him, he scanned him with his phone, and then he put Ahmad on top of Luca as he went up for a slam dunk, and then Ahmad got to see himself as Luca, you know, slam dunking, you know, with his tongue hanging out Michael Jordan style. And I gotta tell you, like, that's not watching basketball live. That's being engaged with the NBA in a different way that for some people, will be like, wow, that's fun, that's cool. I feel closer to my team, I feel closer to my heroes, I feel closer to the league, I wanna do more with the league. And to me, that was, that was sort of a fun, interesting thing to see, because I said, you know, we're, you know, people, you know, do people really wanna produce their own NBA game? Do people really wanna produce their own NASCAR race? Yeah, like a few, like a few, like really few. You know, they mostly wanna watch the professionally produced high-end production of the Super Bowl and of the, of, the, of the NASCAR race. And yeah, maybe they want to see a few in-car cameras, but you know, for the most part, they want to watch the production. And this thing was a sort of, how do you create value for something after it happens? How, how do you engage with it in a, in a way that feels really neat and cool afterwards, which of course becomes another way to engage and another revenue stream. And, it, and to me, that was, you know, you go to these tech summits once a year and you sort of come out of your day job and you, you go, what's interesting? And to me, that, that, that was interesting. And, and people were sort of like, wow, that's cool. I think my kids would like to do that. Right? I'm not sure if I'd want to do it. But, I mean, but, and then <laughs> I said, but, but if I could right. be Wayne Gretzky for a minute, maybe I would want to do it, right? Like, to me, I thought. Absolutely. So we've talked about gaming's influence on fan engagement. What about gambling? How would you each characterize where we are right now in terms of how sports betting has impacted sports media? Uh, I can take a shot. I, I think, um, look, if you look at, at um, fan behavior, this, this isn't new, right? I mean, if you, if you look at the impact that fantasy sports has had on, on viewing and consumption habits of sports, that, that is, has been around. I think now you're, you're starting to slowly introduce money into it, which, which brings some complexities, um, but it also brings opportunity. But I think, and, and not just because we're at, at Sloan, I would say that, that the, the biggest win for, for, you know, uh, for companies like ours is the data. It's, it's just understanding who these fans are and how those behaviors differ. Um, 
and if they're new fans or, or existing fans that have just found another another um, another reason to stay engaged, um, you know, it's it's been interesting to look at the the um, kind of the upside and the downside of of how sports betting comes becomes pervasive in fandom. And one of the things that we've seen that that is is uh, is a little bit interesting is our sport almost moves too fast for gambling, which mm. in the irony of ironies, NASCAR is too fast for something. Um, <laughs> But you know, I, I think if you look at, at in-play betting, is is what is really you know starting to move the needle, at least from a handle perspective. You know, the the speed of our cars going upwards of 200 miles an hour. If if you're looking at lap by lap betting, uh, the the latency of the data you know starts to become a, a bit of a challenge. So, but I look at things like that as as certainly a challenge, but also an opportunity because if if we can start to really understand. The, the cross section of the, the competition data and the data of what our fans are interested in and start to you know super serve those those audiences forget about scale it, it doesn't you know the scale is always going to be the primary broadcast right to Russell's point but if you can start to identify those those very highly engaged segments of fans and cater the behavior to, to them on on whatever platform that might be and sports betting is certainly going to be a big one uh, I think that's that's the the trick yeah, with, with betting, I mean, uh, back in my, my old life, there was such a debate of we can never do this. We have to stay arms and arms and arms length away from betting, and we'll never be in this, in this business, and, and the NFL is certainly into betting now, and, uh, and you know, kind of using it to the advantage. But I think that what we were talking about at the start, it, it can be two different audiences. You can certainly not offend your traditional base who want nothing to do with betting, don't want overlays on their broadcast, and then you can have outlets that, that you can get into betting, and, and it can work seamlessly and then you tap into a new audience. I think you know, something fascinating for me, betting companies and the daily fantasy um, groups, used to be daily fantasy, now they're betting as well, are fantastic marketers. They, they try to speak in a different narrative and dialogue. There's a call to action there that, you know, frankly, I don't know if anyone watched the NFL when, when the daily fantasy started popping up, but you'd see three or four ads in between the, the, the breaks and you say, oh gosh, another daily fantasy ad. But the ratings that year for the NFL were off the charts, record breaking. Because again, different narrative, different audience calling to different things to do. So, um, you know, I, I think the point of it is, um, again, different ways to reach out to individuals to get them interested and engaged. And if you're not into hardcore betting, there's different grades of it of free to play. There's different grades of mini games and things that I just think you need to do as an audience. Because even I get, you know, I, I love a traditional broadcast, but I'll get distracted. I'll get bored. Uh, you know, I have my level of OCD as well, and uh, I'll just move away from it. You know, give me something to fool around and play with that keeps me occupied during during what is usually a few hours match. And uh, again, I, I think there is a space for a different way of presenting the material and different motivations to get people involved. And I think it's obviously it's worked quite well for, for many different companies. And you might also be a good laboratory for this because uh -oh. you just moved from the US <laughs> to the UK. And as a guy who used to run around the world, you know, leading ESPN International, we're so far behind on this stuff in the US. Like, we were eight years ago talking about the in-match betting that Sky Germany was doing with their button where you could, when a goal was scored by one of the soccer teams, you, the odds would change and you could place your, you could place your bet in-match. Right? And so there's a lot to learn from what's happened in the sports gambling landscape outside the United States because it's been going on for a long time. And you know, I remember sort of quivering a little bit when I had to go get permission to take our first gambling ad outside the United States when we weren't taking any gambling ads in the United States and to lay out, you know, you can walk down Main Street in the UK and place a bet next to the grocery store on the soccer match tonight. Some stadiums you know, have the betting shop right outside the door on their land so you can place the bet before you walk into the ground of the Premier League. And so I think, you know, some of what we have here is, you know, black market gambling that was happening here and pent up demand for, you know, low friction, fun to participate in, link to the viewing, you know, as opposed to, you know, just squares the bar where you, you know, pay your 20 bucks. Like you can actually do that with people you don't know. And, uh, and I think the catch-up's been really interesting, and I think not dissimilar to fantasy. And we, by the way, we, we signed up more people this year for fantasy than we've ever signed up before. We signed up more people for Tournament Challenge this past year, which we're about to start for you know, Bracketology than we did the year before. Those are ways that people engage in this stuff, and it makes them more interested in the outcome. You get more interested in the outcome if you got something 
to win and you get more engaging outcome if your grandson, granddaughter, son or daughter are playing in it. Like, and we see those two behaviors, you know. The, the squash viewership of the Ivy League content that we have on ESPN Plus is a lot of families wanting to watch their kid play, you know, competitive Division I squash, right? They're not betting on that, right? <laughs> but you're seeing people betting on the things that they're betting on on, on all the platforms, you know, and the, and the engagement in that goes up. And it's it's a, another engagement factor that I think we're, we're, we've been waiting for it a long time. And, you know, the state-by-state state thing will, of course, take it, cause it to be slower than it was in a lot of our, you know, European, Australian brethren, where it's it's been embedded in sports culture for maybe for 20 or 30 years. So pivoting away from fan engagement for a second, Michael, I wanted to talk to you about the technology that your entities are capturing on the ground floor at every game, in arenas and stadiums every single day. So we know how it's a, a revolutionized officiating, but you've made the point that it's more than just officiating support. Can you talk to us a bit about the ways that all of that technology and data is actually solving business problems in sports media? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, we, we obviously are proud of and want to continue to be best in class officiating. I mean, that's, that's our bread and butter from a Hawkeye perspective, and we're going to continue doing that because it's crucial to the, you know, we want to be the precise and, and transform the game in, in, in a proper way, right? Um, and, and so that will continue, but the reality is there's so much pressure on P&Ls. There's so much pressure to do more than just have a cost center. And so what we want to do is take the data that you're extracting in real time to make the right calls, the most precise calls, and send that to the different outlets and, and channels that, that can do fan engagement, that can do things on the performance side from a player standpoint. So, you know, again, we focus a lot of energy on Hawkeye collecting the data. We send it through to our friends at Beyond Sports. They validate it. They create some avatars. and big city greens characters that can roam around and, and act like they're hockey players. Um, and then we serve it on digital platforms with our, with our company Pulse Live. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, really, we're trying to help federations and, and clubs and, and leagues have an ROI story behind what is sometimes pretty substantial investment to get the right call in place. And uh, again, I just think it's a reality coming from the NFL prior. There's just pressure to, to make sure that you're getting as much value as possible with these big partnerships. And a lot of leagues and federations from, from you know, what I've seen, there's so many different vendors and they're consolidating into one and the justification of if I do consolidate into one vendor, they need to be doing more than, than just one thing for me. They have to do five, six, seven, eight things for me. And they have to be aligned with, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, my business goals, not just um, their silo of what they do best. And so that's a lot of the energy we're putting forth, obviously tapping into Sony and all the technology and innovation they bring to the table. They've been very successful on the entertainment side. How can we bring that to, to sports and really solve business problems that people are thinking about, like how do I you know, engage youth fans? How do I help the sport from a media and performance standpoint? And again, it's using that data across the entirety of the ecosystem. But it's also, I mean, it's cha Hawkeye's changed the sport, the underlying sport itself of tennis, right? Like, I mean, Players think about it differently. The 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 appeals system, and then you know the fan at home sees has one experience, but the fan in the in the stadium is act, they're clapping along, waiting for that Hawkeye result to come up, and and they're engaging in a in a whole incremental way. That's it's been pretty exciting to watch the evolution in tennis with Hawkeye, and as partners, you know, on Wimbledon and U.S. Open and and Australian Open, and certainly it's been fun to to watch it go from the, you know. The beginning of just a piece of it to now, you know, the whole court. It's quite, quite exciting. So Michael's entities are providing data to leagues and media platforms that are shaping the future of how we all experience sports. But at an event like this, I have to ask each of you, what data and analytics do you each use every day to inform your own strategic business decisions? I'm going to start with Tim. Uh, it's a it's a good question. I mean, I think uh, there's there's a little bit of you know we talked about the the convergence of art and science, right? I think the big piece of the science one is is going to be a little bit unique to all of us. So, look, our our digital platforms, um, if if you think about it realistically, are, are just going to be the the avid um, you know more more regular fans are not going to be casual. So I think looking at, at you know, ebbs and flows of traffic volume is just not the right way to look at it. It's more of a vanity metric. So you know, just using that as an example, our digital platforms, we, we started years ago looking at consumption. And, and consumption for us is, per visit, it's, it's uh, video views and page views. So the, the way we started looking at that is, you know, to a large extent, what's happening on track is going to dictate 
the, the volume of traffic, right? The Daytona 500 is going to bring a considerably larger, unique audience to our platforms than really any other race. But if you can look at the, the content that's being consumed by those users on any given day or any given week, then I think that tells us that, that we're creating the right experience that we've, we've, you know, we've given them something. Michael made a point earlier about you know, the, the content that, that you have to wade through to find what you're looking for. You know, one of the, the, um, the best pieces of advice I got on, on the digital side years ago was, you know, if you think about the homepage of a website, when that page is loading, someone has got something either consciously or subconsciously that they want to see when that page renders. And if you're loading one or two pieces of content above the fold, you've got that many cho chances to get it right. Where if you load eight, 10, 12 pieces of content above the fold, you're just increasing your ability to, to give them what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So from, a, from an analytics standpoint, I think if you can back that up, that, that you're delivering on what what those fans, depending on the platform, depending on the time of the day or day of the week, then then I think your your chances of you know fulfilling that fandom go up exponentially. Fascinating. I think um, my my first answer is going to be very efficient, focused, and it's actually pretty simple: is are we improving the quality of the game, right? And and you know again, my former life at the NFL, there's a football quality index to see are, are the right calls being made, are the fans getting the quality of the product they want. And if our technology can do that across any sport, um, that's certainly a metric we, we think about. If we're, are we improving the accuracy and, and alongside it with it? Is there a fan engagement component of it? That's phenomenal. Um, on the fan experience and fan engagement side, I think you, uniques are great. Volume is obviously something that everyone's looking about. Uh, but I think now the focus is a bit more on how do you create stickiness? How can you have someone stay on a platform for as long as possible? And again, this, idea that people get distracted and they move from, from place to place and they might find something really cool on, on your, your site and your app, uh, but then never come back. And that's not as valuable as, you know, it used to be this rush of let's get as many names as possible into our database. Uh, but if you get a million names, but only, you know, 500 people are actually responding to the content you're putting forth, that's not helpful, right? And so um, from a fan engagement standpoint, it's, I, I think that's stickiness and getting the uniques coming back over and over again. And how can our content, how our data the virtual recreations put together, how can, that, how can we make that happen? I mean, uh, I, I used to say that I, when, I, when I shifted from ESPN International to ESPN Plus, I went from getting a report every month, at the end of the month, with how many subscribers ESPN's 26 sports channels around the world had in 26 countries. And that report was based on the billing from the month before, which was based on the subscribers from the month before that. So I got a report that had 60-day-old subscribers, and I was thrilled. I knew how many subscribers we had 60 days ago and that we were billing for in that moment. And when I moved over to ESPN Plus, I had a Slack bot on my phone. <laughs> they had to teach me how to use it. Um, I had a Slack bot on my phone to tell me how, how many people we signed up in the last 15 minutes. Right? And so the speed of data, obviously just because of systems and technology, have gotten better. And the usefulness of it is, has become amazing to me because and I think, I think as, you, as, you, as you become practitioners, this is mostly for the students room, like as a practitioner in the world of data, you gotta make a distinction between the data and the insight, right? And we've had research for a long time, there's, and I think there's a real difference between research and data, right? Research, you get syndicated research, you know, how many people are estimated to have watched the Super Bowl by Nielsen, right? At ESPN Plus, we know exactly how many people watched a show that night because it's our data. We're watching them watch it on our platform. We also know how many of those people after watching that show either churned or didn't churn. And we also know what else they watched. And some very smart data scientists and masters and PhDs and other people way smarter than me can build great models you know, using um, a whole bunch of software that has named after snakes and things like that that, that, that can pull that out of the system really quickly and say to me, Hey, Russell, we know that if you watch this and you watch that, your retention rate at the end of the month was much higher. And I think good business leaders need to find a way to, to figure out how to let research and data come together and create more informed leaders. And it's been really interesting when, I first, when, we first, and when you first launch a business, you get, I was like, where's the churn data? Well, we need, we need, we need a few months to get the churn model warmed up and running, and then they could say, hey, these six behaviors are predictive of lower churn. Okay, marketing team, these six behaviors are predictive of lower churn. Go and in incentivize these behaviors, go encourage these behaviors, go help people understand the value of, 
of these behaviors as a fan because it has value to us as a business. And I think, I think as you think about, particularly for the students, as you think about your place in the world of sports, like helping businesses find the, where data and research come together to create more informed leadership to make better decisions and pull levers to grow the business, I think is really, really valuable. And that's coming from someone who my kids would have described as a Luddite, you know, 48 months ago. <laughs> We're going to start before taking I threw, questions before I threw my, from Before I threw my Blackberry away. <laughs> We're going to start taking questions from Twitter in just a second. But before that, I wanted to just ask a couple of lightning round crystal ball type questions. Um, what did you think would have changed by now that hasn't? I stumped them. That's a good one. Um, I, I think, um, I, I know we, we said we wouldn't talk about Web3, but uh, uh, I'm just going to do a, a really quick one. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the, the creator economy, all of the, what, what we spent our period of time doing in Web1 and Web2 was listening to what the social platforms told us was important. So back, back to the, the milk analogy, it was like the grocery stores was telling, uh, were telling us we had to buy more groceries, and we all listened to that for, for decades, and to a certain extent, we still are. And I think you know the more the more that brands and media properties and 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 businesses can kind of take control of that that one to one communication with their fans and their consumers, mm -hmm. I think that's the the dream, right? But you can't turn away from the scale and the volume that you get from from social media platforms. So uh, while I'm I'm I guess I'm equal parts surprised that that model hasn't evolved, but at the end of the day, if if you've got another mechanism to go direct to consumer to reach a billion people uh, that doesn't include going through a social media platform, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to invest in it. Um, so I think kind of equal part surprised and, and not on that one. Okay. Same question or different one? Um, you can take that one or <laughs> how about this one? What, what's going to change your business most materially in the next 18 months? Probably should have stuck with the first question. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I think what I was talking about before of uh, if we can find a way, um, and you mentioned it earlier, Allison, is uh, you know you can take these renders that when we were talking about the Adam Silver example, and and you know take a, a clip and then you know a day later can render into something else. We can actually do that in real time. Uh, and so I, I, what personally gets me very excited, and you know what what I think is going to uh, you know be an evolutionary type of uh, technology is just toggle between real match, real life to gamified, uh, and and you can own the outcome of it. And I, I think that that's, again, Sony and, and kind of playing to our products a little bit is watch uh, an NHL match on ESPN Plus and then press a button and you toggle into now I'm going to control the match and you know source the outcome and then I can go back and see what actually happened in the game. And that's, I think that, that power of that, because you have data, you have the live broadcast, both are happening simultaneously, just being able to flip to one or the other I think is going to be fascinating. And I think it's really going to revolutionize, hopefully creating Engage audiences out of the ones that just don't have time for a three-hour um, session. I'm watching in front of you know the traditional big screens. Yeah. So here's one from Twitter that could any of you could take it or all of could you could blow the whole panel open. <laughs> Completely blowing up. Okay. So how do you quantify how much to invest in your new technologies, new platforms, and new narratives that appeal to younger generations? Since we spent so much time talking about it's all you listen. I mean, I, for us, I I don't think it's any different than valuing. A right, right? I mean, we ultimately have to make, you know, the senior leadership of a co any company, but certainly, you know, Bob Iger and Jimmy Patero at Disney and ESPN have to allocate resources. Um, and we have to decide what the best use of our, our funds are. And I don't think it's any different than, than the way we evaluate a right. If we buy this technology and it does X, Y, or Z for us, people watch more, it enables us to sell ads for more money, it enables it, it help, encourages people to stay longer. That then has a return, and we and we and I think we we think about that no differently than, boy, if we could get the right to cut highlights this way, or we could get the right to put the highlight. Remember, in the early days, we weren't allowed to put the highlights on social, right? And so, when we got the right to put the highlights on social on our social handles on their platforms, right? That had an incremental value, and I think I think, as we think about you know, investing in technology, buying technology, renting technology, partnering on technology, we, we think about it the same way, which is, you know, how does it enhance the time fans will spend with us? The other, the other thing is we're building a lot of technology around ad tech because the world is moving fast in terms of ad tech. And I think the thing that's moving, the 18-month question before is like, 
addressable advertising, that is changing rapidly. And both, you know, again, under the same headlines before, you can't sell people something they don't want. Like when advertisers are still ready only to do one thing, you can't drag them to the other thing. But they're all looking for more addressable, more targeted, more data back advertising. And so the need for us and others to build out on our own and with some support from, from vendors, you know, high quality ad tech for Hulu, Disney Plus, and, and ESPN Plus, as well as our ex linear experiences through through digital platforms, I think is really important. And I think we've done a pretty good job of it. And you'll, you saw last year, and you'll see again this year in the upfronts, more money transacting on the addressable side than ever before. And you know, at our shop, you know, Rita Farrow and that team do an amazing job doing that. I think I think we're on the cutting edge of that. Um, you know, from a from a broadcaster perspective, so and it's exciting. A, here's a quick one for each of you. What's more important, view counts or time spent viewing? I've already, I've already tipped my hand. It's time spent viewing in my mind, uh, and what I said, just getting getting more than just a, a, a five second visit and getting that person engaged and back and having a one-to-one -one conversation like Tim was saying before, that's critical because then you can actually give them something and, and try and, uh, and expose them to other parts of, of your offering and your platform and your technology. It's definitely for me engaged viewing. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I mean, and, and it's no different from any other human interaction. I mean, you can, you can glad hand 50 people or you can have a meaningful conversation with two or three and, and I think you know, there, there's certainly more, more depth and value in, in the second. Do you concur? Want them to stick around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for fans who cannot watch a game live, especially from an international perspective, how do you approach your non-live media to get the same level of engagement or interaction from fans? You know, if it... As a guy who got sent to Hong Kong and Singapore by ESPN 26 years ago, if it really matters, you get up in the middle of the night to watch it, right? I mean, literally, mm -hmm. when, you, when you go to Singapore, they're, they're, they're watching the Premier League when the Premier League's paid. As a girl who grew up in Hong Kong, right. we skipped school to watch the Super Bowl. Right, you know, Monday, did not match up. <laughs> Super Bowl Monday in Australia is a big deal. That's right. right? That's right. <laughs> and they're getting up and going to breakfast parties to watch the Super Bowl. But that's not for everything, right? And so... You know, you put in spoil or suppression so that fans don't have to see the scores of the things they don't want to see before they go back to watch it on a non-live basis. But I think we've had the belief that, you know, put it out live and then you can replay it or make it available somewhere else. But um, we're not big believers in delaying things and haven't been for a long time, whether that's the Olympics or, you know, Australian Open. You know, put it out live and if we need to summarize it or make it available for people to go back, you know, let them do it. But, you know, tape delay is not a big popular topic in Bristol, Connecticut. Yeah. <laughs> I like this one because it's a follow-up on, on one of my questions. Per Allison's question regarding the social side of social media, how do you recreate the social experience of watching sports in the age of young fans who watch highlights on their own devices? Ooh, I, I mean, I think um, if you look at something like uh, the Manning cast, I think that's a that's a perfect example, right? Or or even the the Nickelodeon NFL game. I, I think you and and look what what these guys are doing is a perfect example of that. I, I think you've got to take the the fundamentals of what people care about and why people are passionate about sports and deliver that in a different way. And and it's you know in a world where it's really hard to come up with creative and unique ideas. There, there's room for that on the on the back of sports. If you look at you know of every year when they put out the report of the the you know the most highly viewed live TV events, it's all sports. All sports. And and so you you have to take advantage of that passion, but to the social aspect of whether it's conversational or or whether it's it's more leaned back than leaned in. Um, I, I, again, I give a lot of credit to to the notion of of taking a a, a kid's show or a kid's platform or, or a non-traditional um, presentation model for, for what people love about sports. Yeah, and I, I think it's taking the sport and putting it into the, whatever platform they are engaging on. So again, example, we, we did a bunch with FIFA and Roblox and uh, took the live match, put it in the Roblox environment, and there, there's already individuals engaging virtually in that environment and oh great now we can do it with the overlay of a, and a match that we may have thought may not have thought about before and so I, I think it's all about fishing where the fish are and bringing sport to non-sport fans and i think that's how you create a community i mean the, the biggest thing for me is you just think about nfl stadiums were huge but it's just a microcosm of the actual 
fan base and audience. And so how do you connect everyone that is sitting at home and didn't go, didn't get a ticket, wasn't able to get a ticket, um, and connecting those millions of individuals, and that's the challenge. But again, I think these progressive social slash virtual engagement uh, communities, which are massive around the younger fans, it's a great opportunity to do that. So regarding Russell's comment on multiple ways to view a single game, the kids version versus the regular, how far away are we from fully personalized broadcasts? Okay, who asked that? <laughs> I mean, I, it depends on what you mean by personalized. If it's truly, you know, if it's choice, it's one thing. If it's personalized, that's a whole different thing. So, I mean, NASCAR, you can watch feeds of different in-car cameras and you know you can watch different courts at the Australian Open, yeah. uh, and for a long time you've been able to watch the home and away broadcast of an out-of-market game. So you can listen to the Rangers broadcast or the Flyers broadcast or the Celtics broadcast, right? But the next thing of you tell me you're a Patrick Kane fan. I know you're a Patrick Kane fan when he was at the Blackhawks, he's now gone to the Rangers, and when we deliver you the Ranger game, we're gonna give, deliver you the Patrick cam, the Kane cam. You know, I think it's, it's possible, but the question is, is it, is it where the business is gonna make, is, is gonna make sense? And I think, I think it's, it's, you know, we're already delivering you customized, you know, the highlights use, if you're, by the way, if, if any of you aren't registered users at ESPN.com, you should be. It's free. And we'll, we'll give you better highlights because we'll know what you like. And the highlight feed you get will be based on what you watch, what you tell us you like, and your behavior. And so do it. It'll make your day, it'll make your day better. Um, and so there's some of that stuff that, that happens every day in our business. And that's easy and smart and good. Requires you to do something. Give us your name and your email address and tell us what your favorite teams are. And then go be a fan and we'll help you be a better fan and have more fun with it. Um, but the next thing I think is a, is, is a possibility, but we have to figure out if the business model makes sense for each of those things. All right, here's another crystal ball question for all of you. What does sports content consumption look like in 10 years? What's the next big thing? You know, I'm going to build off of, of the last question and, and oddly enough, the one before it, I think the, you know, to, to Russell's point on the technology or the business model of how you could go for, for a more personalized experience, then you're further removed from the social piece of sports, which is this communal nature, whether it's if you're in the venue or in a sports bar or on social media. <laughs> if my experience is personalized and it's different from, from yours, then our ability to communicate about what that's, what's happening instantly goes away because we're, we're seeing something unique to one another. And, so I think of, of you know, the next big thing is it, it may not need to shift as much as we think that it does. The subtle change of, of getting someone to enjoy that experience from, from a sports fan perspective doesn't have to be dramatically different and, and you know, uber customized, right? Because I think we've, we've got to appreciate the fact that there are tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people that will show up in an arena and sit next to strangers mm -hmm. and have this uh, incredible once in a lifetime moment because of their love of sports. And, and I don't think we can stray too far from that. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, I, I agree with Tim completely. I don't think it changes from an existing today. You just go deeper and you're gonna have more immersive experiences, more probably platforms you can, you can consume on that's not just one place to go. And, and again, the personalization question, we can do a heck of a lot of personalization today. We'll be able to do that 10, 20, 100 times over um, when, when you get to five, 10 years from now. So I'm going to close us out on a, a question that relates to how many students we have in the room here. All the folks here are going to want to be on the teams who are creating the future of sports media, and you all are recruiting for and fielding those teams. What are you looking for? Hustle. I mean, I, I think there's there's a lot that, that I think we all probably look for, but, um, you know, it, it, it ultimately just comes down to putting the work in. I mean, you know, everyone in this room or everyone on this panel you get to a certain point uh, because of how, how much you're, you're willing to put into it. And I, I don't even mean the hours, like you have to work in, in, you know, until two o'clock in the morning. It's not that, it's just, you know, doing something that someone else isn't willing to do is, is gonna move the needle tremendously. Yeah. 
I would, I would say passion. And it doesn't have to be a passion for a single sport or sports in general. It's just a passion for trying to transform whatever product is out there. Um, that, that's number one. I think a strategic lens. Uh, you can be the best technologist in the world, the best data scientist, analyst, but you need to know what Tim's you know, losing sleep over every day or getting excited about every time he wakes up in the morning and, and having that lens of I'm, I'm passionate about what I do, I want to deliver the best product possible, but I also want to make sure that product serves whatever needs are for the federations and ultimately the fans. And if you have that mix, uh, I, I think it'd be really, really something special. Yes and yes, and team player, good communicator, good follower. Followership is important, right? We're hiring people who we want to be good at following their leaders. Um, and then, you know, no typos. You know, be polite. <laughs> Send the follow-up email. Be be a good interviewer. Like make like we're when by the way everything's an interview, including the conversation you're going to have with Mike when you come up here afterwards. Right? It's all an interview. There are no informational interviews. They all they all they all they all they all matter. And I think you know you want to make sure that you are putting your best foot forward because you may not get a second chance uh, to put your best foot forward. And we're trying to decide if we want you around the table in the meeting on Tuesday. That's what we're trying to decide when we interview you. And, uh, and, and good luck, it's fun, it's a great industry. If, if, if you can have a career for 26 years working in the business we work in, having fun working at sports, yeah. Alice and I work together at ESPN, like, it's fun. And hopefully you can all find your passion within that industry because, by the way, we have finance people who would tell you they're in the sports business, we have PR people who tell you in their sports business, we have sports producers who tell you in their sports business, and we have lawyers who would tell you they're in the sports <laughs> business. And you know what? They're all in the sports business. Well, my rapidly failing vocal cords held out just long <laughs> enough. Thank you all for being here with us, and huge thanks to Russell and Michael and Tim and to Leo for bringing us together.